There is one big controversy in political science, and sometimes even a divide when the question is whom to hire, whom to promote, and it is between those who call themselves rational choice and those who call themselves deliberative scholars. I'm just back from Bucharest, where I had also some from philosophy in rational choice, and we had a good debate. And it's all ultimately about human nature. So it is going back all the way to ancient Greece, who we are. Whether we are siding more with Hobbes or with Kant. So what is this divide? What is this controversy? On the one hand, we have scholars who assume we are, in our daily life, just egotistical. To put it in more technical terms, we are individual utility maximizers, which goes under the name rational choice. We are just rational to pursue our personal interests, which may be also in our personal life. Gary Becker, who comes out of the Chicago school and just passed away two weeks ago, got the Nobel Prize for applying this rational choice model to your personal relations. So when you go on a date, you just calculate what the opportunity costs are, meaning what you could do otherwise, and then what the price is of the dinner, who is paying. And I'm now married for 50 years with my wife, who is taking a nap at the hotel. So we should calculate every morning whether we would like to stay together and you know, what alternatives there are and calculating the reactions of the children and grandchildren. And seriously, Gary Becker wrote a book and got the Nobel Prize for applying this economic model to your personal relations. So I would come only to Pristina because I have made all these calculations. The balance was, this was better. Which is pretty much Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes. Now, the opposite is that some of us some of the time care for the well-being of others. What may go under the term altruism. This is the basis of the deliberative model. That I advocate. Now, we are not so naive to think we are also egotistical. I would even acknowledge that maybe most of us in 90%, 95%, maybe even more, just pursue our self-interest. But some of the time, we truly care for others and care for the common good. Now, the punchline is we cannot decide who is right. 
like in philosophy, we could not decide whether Kant was right or whether Hobbes was right. We just make different assumptions about human nature. Now, in Bucharest, we had a very nice conversation because the rational choice people did not come in an imperialistic way and say, this is the truth. So I'm very willing to talk in a reasonable way with rational choice people as long as they do not claim this is just the entire truth. And some do. I was once called in the literature as an idealist and romantic, and of course it was meant in a negative way. And I say, hooray. Sometimes, indeed, I try to be idealistic and romantic. Now, my lecture will be first to present what rational choice means for politics, and then say what the liberation means. Now, if you apply rational choice, which is still dominant, if you look at the American Political Science Review, Maybe 80% are based rational choice. And I've just heard in London School of Economics, they are just about to get uh, the majority in the faculty, and also at uh, Nuffield College in Oxford. So they just assume that politicians are only interested in the election and the re-election and power to be on particular committees and maybe having limousines. So if it is a question whether you go to war in Iraq or not, or in the Ukraine, you would only calculate whether this is good for your re-election chances. Or if you deal with climate change, whether you should do something about pollution, you would not care whether children die out of pollution in 50 years. You would just calculate how this would work out for the next election. Same way voters. For example, if it is a health care bill, like Obamacare in the U.S., you would just calculate whether Obamacare is profiting for you or not. So you would not care whether this helps the poor people somewhere in Mississippi. You would vote only for Obamacare if your calculation is that uh, it helps you. So let's understand this. Rational does not mean vernunft in the sense of Kant, for whom vernunft is a goal. You should be vernunftig, reasonable. It only means that you pursue your goals in an efficient, rational way. Now, when I studied the 60s, rational choice was not around. It was only introduced in the 80s and came from economists who came into political science and others, political scientists who began a training in economics, which is raising the question whether the rational choice model is really good in economics. Now, about two weeks ago, I had the great pleasure that I have to tell you. I read about a speech of Andrew Haldane, who is executive director for financial stability of the Bank of England frontal attack on economists 
who are misreading Adam Smith. Adam Smith, of course, supposedly wrote, if everyone pursues his or her self-interest, then you have the invisible hand of the market that is leading to a wonderful equilibrium that is serving the common good. An economist then can have these mathematical elegant models that rational choice people can also do. Now, Adam Smith has written uh, 800 pages, The Wealth of Nations that I have read. I've not yet met a single economist who has read the entire wealth of nation. It's partly hard reading, but the invisible hand appears a single time at about page 600 in a subordinate clause. More importantly, Adam Smith was a moral philosopher, and his main book was The Theory of Moral Sentiment. And this executive director of the Bank of England said, all these bankers are misreading Adam Smith because in his main work he was emphasizing cooperation, altruism. Now, how about the invisible hand? He meant it only in the 18th century for very simple situations. Like in a village, you have three bakers. Of course, each baker tries to have the best bread at the best price to make the best profit. But if international investors who give out the in, uh, all these mortgages just pursue their individual interests, then you run into the financial crisis. And think about this. This was not some philosopher. This was a responsible leader of the Bank of England who said economists should have to rethink their models. If bankers just pursue their self-interest, So, there are some reasons that Adam Smith is not a good basis to support rational choice. You may use others like Gary Becker. But the invisible hand of Gary Smith is just, for him at least, not a central point. Now, what is now the opposite of rational choice? And again, I, I was saying it's a big debate in political science is between rational choice and deliberation. And the former is just assuming that we are constantly egotistical, maximizing our individual utilities. And I was just saying, Adam Smith is not a good base for this. Now, the deliberative model, as I said before, is acknowledging most of the time we are egotistical, but not always. There may be, we have three sons at the University of North Carolina, and there with the employment comes good health insurance. And they are supporting Obamacare, although it is to their disadvantage, because their taxes will increase, 
and their health insurance will not be uh, better. But they just support it because I think people who don't have uh, health insurance end up in a terrible situation. Then in Bucharest, one of the rational people said, oh, ultimately they do it in their self-interest because they don't want to, in the long term, a revolution of all these discriminated people, which is again showing you cannot prove either uh, one approach or the other. Now, deliberation through Habermas is going back to Kant. So Habermas, acknowledging himself, very much influenced by Kant. And of Kant, of course, had a categorical imperative that your behavior should be such that it can be a law for the entire country. So if you are constantly in corrupt behavior or steal or lie, this would not be a good law. More importantly, Kant said you should always treat others as goal in themselves, not exploit others for your own benefits. So if you go tonight for a date, you should not think what's in for me, but maybe what's in for us as a couple of In 16th century, there was a uh, English poet by the name of John Donne who said, when you hear the death bell somewhere in the world, you know, the church ringing, it rings for you too. So if a baby dies of AIDS in South Africa, it dies for you too, because you are part of humanity. The major unit are not we as just isolated individuals, but we should look for the well-being of humanity. So if we see a child dying of aid should touch you. You should suffer. Although it's not influencing directly your life. When I wrote this book, I just happened to read the biography of uh, Nelson Mandela, who of course was treated very badly for years and years on an island by brutal guards, but he says, even with these guards, sometimes he has seen a flame of goodness. So that we all have a kind of flame of goodness that sometimes is just hidden, or as a Wilson said, we have an internal moral sense that we just care also for others. And of course, in religious thinking, we have always this idea that we should care also for others. Now, <clears throat> who is right? Who gets a better handle at the reality, rational choice or deliberation? Now I acknowledge that rational choice can explain a lot, and I don't mind. If you look what's happening in Washington these days, between the White House and the Republicans in Congress, maybe just pure rational choice. And yet, Obama got some uh, classes at Harvard on deliberation by some of my colleagues, like Jenny Mansbridge. And when he gave his acceptance speech in Chicago, 
after his first election. This was just pure deliberation. Just look to the others for the common good, but then he ran into Republicans who were just not willing. He, they just wanted to him out. So, I do not negate that rational choice is a legitimate, a legitimate enterprise. They can explain a lot. But hopefully they cannot explain everything because as this executive director of, the, of uh, the Bank of England says, if everyone just pursues self-interest, we may run into the financial crisis and others. Now, in all this, we professors have probably the most important role because we teach about human nature. And if you teach from kindergarten on rational choice, then people have this schema. Let me give you evidence for this. At Cornell University, they had a huge lecture class of 800 people. Introduction into economics. They divided it randomly in two groups, and students did not know, and they just had to fill out before the semester a class about egoism and altruism. In one group, it was just classical macro and microeconomics. Just everyone is trying to profit to uh, maximize profits. In the other class, about hunger in the third world, and AIDS, and climate change, and so on. And after a single semester in a single class, you had a significant difference at the end of the semester, which is indicating we professors have an influence how people perceive the world, how they perceive human nature. And my impetus is to tell students, sure, most of the time we are egotistical, but sometimes not. Some of us, let me just give you another example. Václav Havel, he was a playwright dissident in Czechoslovakia. He was offered 68 to go into exile, have a good life there, but no, he stayed in the country and to continue to criticize the regime. They put him into labor camp where he got pneumonia and almost died. And he wrote wonderful letters to his wife Olga, that you should read letters to Olga, where he said, uh, we should live in truth with ourselves. Now, in uh, 89, oh wonder, he became president of Czechoslovakia. Smart guy. Was a good investment to go to labor camp, nearly die, because he became a hero. And uh, so this would be classical rational choice. So even here, rational choices would say, okay, there are exceptions like Havel or Gandhi or Mother Teresa. And my argument is these exceptions may be exemplary. And I had once a paper where I wrote, we need more politicians like Václav Havel and we should tell our students so. And what's so terrible for me especially in the United States. Students are just trained, rational choice, go to Washington, become staffers, and just say, play the game how they learned it in college. Just... Now, we are not philosophers in our group, but we are taking it from philosophers and uh, trying to put their ideas of Habermas, but also for others, in reality, we have analyzed 
initially parliamentary debates in the UK, the US, Germany and Switzerland. And then we have, for example, analyzed in Brussels, where about 400 people from all over Europe, randomly selected, came over a long weekend and talked about climate change and immigration. And more recently in the next book, Interested in Deeply Divided Society in Colombia, you know, where the war still goes on, there is a program of decommissioning. So there are ex-combatants and we could gather about 400 of them and they discuss in small groups how we can arrive at peace in uh, Colombia. Another is in Bosnia, in Srebrenica, where we brought together Serbs and Bosniaks and talking how life can become better in Srebrenica in Bosnia in general. And for this, we have developed an index that we call Discourse Quality Index, abbreviated DQI, that is now worldwide uh, widely used. And we just measure the individual speech acts. Without going into details, we see to what extent arguments of others are noted and respected, and especially if people are willing, to use the Habermasian term, to follow the force of the better argument. So if I would say in a faculty meeting, Arben, I have listened to you, and I did not think about this, I can follow you, so your argument convinces me. So, so the basic element of the index, it has many other elements, is whether you are willing intellectually to listen to other arguments, and just to say, okay, I'm convinced by the force of the argument. So this is kind of the key, whether politics is not just power, but sometimes intellectual arguments. And of course, politicians always make arguments, but rational choice say, talk is cheap. No. If you say, I do this for the common good, rational choice say, oh, this is just talk. Whereas we are trying carefully to see whether people honestly, truthfully listen to others and think in terms of what is just, what is good, what serves the common good. Now, all this has practical implications. And the, uh, all over the world, and I hope soon also in Kosovo, and partly you do this already, one example that is particularly forceful is in the Tuscan in the Toscana, where they had a pre preliminary phase of four years and I've now made it permanent. <clears throat> so the regional parliament in the Toscana is allocating every year 800,000 euro to organize on all major projects that they have in the region, group discussions, before the formal decision-making process begins. So if, for example, if they want somewhere to build a factory to fight air pollution, you know, they would have to organize small groups of 15 or so. And in the Toscana, all the universities like Siena, Firenze, and Pisa, have now a massive program in deliberation to have qualified people who know how to put together these groups and 
how to lead them, how to write reports. Now, all this is not yet about decisions, it is only in a consultative way. And it's also limited to 90 days. So it is not a delaying tactic. You cannot do this for uh, uh, two years. So these uh, groups, and there is quite a large office in Florence organizing it. So when the parliament in uh, Florence wants to do something in, in a direction, you need now in the pre-parliamentary phase these discussions where they do not necessarily have to agree. Different groups may also uh, end up with different recommendations. Now, we talked about this yesterday, and there are two aspects, because there is a lengthy law, so if you read Italian, you can read this law, you just go to the region of uh, the Tuscany. In the law, it is said, the government and the politicians have to take this seriously. Which Arden said, they may still not do it. But what helps is the recommendations of these groups have to be published. So there will be a public debate. Now, in Parliament, they still can say, we have our independent judgment. We do not follow what the people are telling us. But then comes the next election, and the people can say, OK, we want to re-elect them or not. So the point is not that politicians have necessarily to follow what people say. There is a famous book by John Kennedy written with Sorensen, Profiles in Courage, when they studied members of Congress who just took positions that they knew what cost them the election. So, in the Toscana now, if you have a project, it has to be preceded by a broad-based group discussions, moderated, so this is as much as possible, deliberative, so people listen to each other's arguments, consider long-term common good considerations, the questions of justice, and then the politicians have to take it seriously. There will be a public debate because it is published. And this is already done now for four years. In one case, I describe in some detail in the new book. And I find this now all over the world, in Canada, in Finland, in Australia. It is a participatory, deliberative renewal of democracy. And there is so much talk these days about democratic deficit. For example, in Brussels, they spent now millions also on citizen participation because they realize, you know, people do no longer trust just the politicians. And what's interesting is that we find, for example, in Colombia or Srebrenica, ordinary citizens are more willing to listen to each other than politicians, because politicians often like to keep the divisions, because this is the base for their uh, power. And uh, in order to have <coughs> citizens that can do this, you need good education beginning from kindergarten, where the teacher will not stand in front of the class and say, the French Revolution had five reasons and test it in the next hour, where material is handed out and in small groups they would try to see <coughs> why did the French Revolution come about and have a group discussion, group work, discussions in the entire class and the teacher only stand. So in this way, uh, students would become good citizens. Now let me end with a touching uh, story. The University of North Carolina had a small seminar and I asked them to write a paper what they have learned in their school days to deliberate or not learned. And some said schools were just terrible with learning about deliberation. 
and Rachel, who is now a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, wrote a touching story how Mrs. Davis, her fourth great, uh, great uh, teacher, taught them how to listen to each other, all these elements. And, and then they learned in fourth grade to listen to each other and to discuss. And this Mrs. Davis is now retired, and I gave Rachel the book. And she brought her the book for Christmas, and where she was quoted. So this teacher, you know, there is nothing wonderful to be a teacher and to see that years later you realize that people have learned something and have learned, in this case, not only substance, but how to behave towards others. And uh, maybe just a last thing. No, when you read Habermas, it just looks abstract. And then you go to Kant, it even looks more abstract. But I had recently a student who told me, very interesting, but it's not new for me. This is also what my parents always told me. Just listen to others, be respectful, right? try to justify what you want. So in a way, it's kind of more natural. And uh, when I was a student, we did not think about the rational choice. This just came about, and this is again showing how important academics are. I mean, if you think about rational choice, there was really one person who was at the beginning, Milton Friedman, together with his wife, at, uh, who just built up the Chicago School. And a lot of people then of the Chicago School spread all over the world. And uh, I, I just find it fascinating, and I find it fascinating also to talk with rational choice people in Bucharest. They still had more reasons <laughs> why our sons were uh, supporting Obamacare that this was ultimately in their self-interest. And, and uh, if I would have to tell you why I came to Pristina, I would not know. I mean, human nature is so complex. Even if I would go to a psychiatrist, probably they could not tell us why I came here. So it's kind of strange when economists and rational choices just assume, unfortunately, there is now a new tendency in economics called behavioral economics but they are no longer just assuming. They just observe reality and do all kinds of experiments. And there, all of a sudden, see, all their models are too simple. Einstein once said, science is to reduce uh, complexity, but please not too much. And I think rational choice is just reducing reality too much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Stein.